please join me in welcoming Ahmed Khan and Chin Chin Yap to the stage. <clears throat> So this might not be the most obvious topic to begin a fashion industry conference, but the, as I said in the introduction, the reason we've decided to put this issue front and center is because it is one of the greatest challenges fas facing um, our, our, our planet today. Um, and Ahmed, you know, when you and I first spoke on the phone about a month or two ago, um, we exchanged some stories and some learnings about you know, the, the things that you've observed, um, the things that you've experienced in this, um, and the shift that you've made in your life. And I just thought we could start with both of you, actually, just talking about the time in Lesbos, where I think has become one of the flashpoints of yeah. this crisis. Yeah. Tell us, you know, the, you know, the story of how you first got into this um, field of work and how it's become this kind of defining purpose for you now, Ahmed. Sure. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank you for uh, having us and for Fashion being open to hearing about this issue. Um, we're sort of on a mission to expand uh, the audiences uh, that are aware of what's going on with the refugee crisis, and we need leaders, and leaders in fashion would be remarkably helpful because international humanitarian assistance is an insular system, much as many of our fields are, um, so it's often people speaking with themselves about what a great job they're doing, but this film shows it's basically an indictment of the system, and the system has completely failed. It's failed the refugees, and it's failed us. It's failed humanity. Uh, the system is designed to fail. Um, so we're on a mission to, to attack the system, to attack the design of the system, and then to start a new system. So to go back to your question, um, I had been involved in humanitarian assistance, you know, sort of as a part-time philanthropist, let's say. I, um, I uh, had a foundation, I have a family foundation, and I would visit refugee camps once or twice a year. I had worked in the Rwandan camps in the 90s after the genocide. Um, and one day, and I, I left disheartened by the system, uh, the failure of the system. And I left disheartened and said, one day I'm going to come back and do it my, my way. And that one day appeared. I was... Uh, attending a gala in Saint-Tropez, uh, the Leonardo DiCaprio Foundation Gala, which was you know, sort of over the top, uh, glitzy and champagne and all that stuff. And uh, you know, that was, that's, it is what it is. They raise money and people like that. Um, but I wound up taking a train from Nice to Milan to meet a friend. And along that train ride, I ran into refugees. I'd just look out the window and I'd see refugees. And this is the summer of 2015 when the European refugee crisis began. Um, and so I got out and I would ask people, what are you doing? And they'd say, well, we left Syria, we left Iraq. Uh, we understand that people are in Turkey, they're in Lebanon, they're in Jordan, but those countries are full. Now, these are very small countries, Jordan and Lebanon, for example, they have a million point five refugees in each of them, just unimaginable numbers. Um, so they tried to get to Europe and they use uh, human traffickers and smugglers to get to Europe. And I saw their condition, so I just decided, you know what, um, I called my friend in Milan and said I'm not gonna make it and I actually spent a week doing what you see in the film, just sort of with my backpack, just sort of living the life of a refugee to try and find out what was happening, understand their stories, and the stories were horrendous, uh, just awful. Um, you know, women who had lost their husbands, their parents, uh, half of their children, just trying to get their children to safety. Um, and so as luck would have it, as it were, I was uh, meeting a friend in Mykonos of all places. And I went there, and uh, probably a few of you have been there, and it's sort of over the top, and I saw a renowned... Not that different from Saint-Tropez. <laughs> no, it, it, <laughs> literally, so literally. So you're getting a sense of Ahmed's lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm only telling you this just to put it in context. I, it was a pre-planned trip, so I go from being a refugee for a week, I go from Saint-Tropez to being a refugee for a week to meeting a friend in Mykonos. So I arrive in Mykonos uh, at a well-known restaurant, and there's a well-known uh, British uh, person uh, popping champagne bottles, and I walk out, and I walked out on the life immediately. I, just, I, I went straight to Lesbos uh, from Mykonos, and I said, I am not doing this anymore, and that was it. That was. Uh, <laughs> and what did you what did you actually observe when you got to Lesbos? Because as I said earlier, it was a flashpoint. Yeah. So, 
and, and it was a dichotomy. So in Mykonos and Central Pay, you have people with $200 million yachts spending a million bucks a day on whatever. Um, and in Lesbos, we saw people running for their lives, uh, just trying to protect their children in rubber boats with fake uh, life preservers. Uh, those aren't actually real life preservers. If you wear them, they don't protect you, you drown. Uh, and people dying every single day. And no support from the system. Uh, so theoretically, people would think, ah, oh, you know, there should be the UN there or the EU or somebody. Nobody was there. There were volunteers from around, you know, Europe and the world, sort of college kids, you know, trying to do their best, but there was no structural support. And these are war refugees. These are people who've lost their homes, their place of business, their family, uh, their health care, their towns have been flattened. They deserve some sort of protection, and they're receiving absolutely nothing. Uh, and all they want to do is be safe. So that's, uh, I said, I, you know, I have to do something about this. You know, for your first reaction is someone should do something about this. And you look around, and then there really isn't anyone. And then you sort of say, well, OK, I'll do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's become uh, sort of a full-time thing now. Yeah. Chin Chin, um, when Ai Weiwei went to Lesbos, mm -hmm. he was also sparked to get involved in this, in this space. Can you talk a little bit about that? And, your journey of making this film with him? Sure, absolutely. I think Wei Wei's um, experience when he first went to Lesbos is quite similar to Ahmed's in the sense um, Wei Wei came to Germany from China in the fall of 2015. He had just been under house arrest for three years in China, and uh, when he arrived in Europe, you know, he was really curious to go to Lesbos because he had heard so much about it and wanted to, to see things firsthand for himself. So we went with his family and friends in, around Christmas time. And when we got there, I mean, he was really captivated by what was going on, like Ahmed was saying, because Lesbos is a beautiful island. There are like flamingos and lagoons, and it's where Aristotle actually studied zoology and wrote the history of animals. So it has a really uh, great historical significance. But when you're there, you see people appearing in rubber boats on the horizon, and they arrive, and you know they're wet or cold, and they don't speak English, and they they need a lot of help. And I mean, back then it was even easier for them to come from Turkey. It's much worse now, unfortunately. But um, that was how Weiwei decided to start making the film, and he. He started almost immediately. We did the film in about one year for production, which is pretty fast because, as you said, we filmed in 23 countries. But he felt it was very important to get the film out while it was a timely issue and that maybe the film couldn't help uh, change some things in the film that are shown in the film. Yeah. So both of you have come into this space from outside kind of the humanitarian, traditional humanitarian sector, let's call it a charitable sector, nonprofit sector. Um, if you were going to like diagnose the, the, the kind of root causes of the crisis, you know, and I, I know it's a multifaceted, very complex issue to break down, but just to educate us from your own personal observations and experience, like how do you, how do you explain what's happening? In Syria and Iraq, it's very simple. Afghanistan as well, it's war. Uh, war is an economy. Um, our leaders are addicted to war. Uh, they're addicted to selling weapons uh, randomly uh, without sort of due diligence. And the amount of destruction out there caused by the weapons that we sell into these conflicts is off the charts crazy. Um, it makes no sense. And that is the driver um, now expanding into Libya, uh, expanding into Yemen. Uh, that's the main driver, and that's my focus is war refugees because I think you know they were basically like us. You know they were professional, they had jobs, they kids went to school, um, and everything's been taken away from them. So now they've been moved from a productive member of society into that group of people that is completely dispossessed that we don't care about as a global community. And you know, a friend pointed out to me, you know, these 65 refugees, the 65 million refugees you're talking about, they've now joined the maybe 800 million or a billion people on Earth that no one cares about and no one even thinks about, right? Um, that are just very poor and they don't know where the next meal is coming from. So it, it, it's really actually strange for the refugee to join that group. It's strange for them. It's strange for everybody. Um, so I, war is, is, is the main problem, and I think we have to demand of our leaders to just stop it. 
Um, they don't know what they're getting into, and you can go into each one of these, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, the list goes on. Um, Would you say, Ahmed, with, with regard to the Syrian war, there's been some criticism that you know, the Obama administration didn't intervene enough, early on enough. Did uh, that contribute to this kind of war-fueled crisis? Well, they, they intervened in a, to an extent of sending weapons irresponsibly. So that led to war. Now, theoretically, you know, Bashar Assad's not, uh, you know, he's not Mother Teresa, but uh, the country was safe and people were secure. Uh, there has to be a better way. There has to be a better way of our leaders to engage in these issues rather than regime change. Regime change is a horrible idea. It doesn't work. And people die. The problem is our policymakers never actually see the people dying. They don't deal with these people. They don't see them. They don't watch these children with one leg or one arm or, you know, without an eye. Uh, they, don't, they don't meet the children and say, you know, talk to them and, have, you know, why is my father dead? They, don't, they never do that, right? So they just send weapons. So they were responsible in sending weapons, beginning the process of the destabilization of, uh, of Syria. So when people say they didn't do enough, I think they, they, they did too much of whatever they were doing. Mm -hmm. um, and it just leads to instability, sending weapons into places. And, you know, the far right has controlled the narrative now saying, you know, they just want our benefits and they're just coming for fun. And uh, the citizens of all these countries should know that their leaders or contemporaries or colleagues are making money off all these wars. Because you name a country and I'll show you a box full of weapons that are being sold into the country. So, you know, the amount of hypocrisy is, is, is nuts. Okay, so war is one core cause. Climate change. Talk to me about that, because that plays a big part in this too. You'll see climate change with regard to... Uh, economic migrants, climate change will actually lead to instability and war because people will fight over resources. So you see that in sub-Saharan Africa um, for sure and I guess you know the way things are going the problems with the climate will expand. So you see that in Sudan, you see that in northern Kenya, you see that in Somalia, um, climate change affecting uh, local communities and then instability developing and people just saying look I have to be safe, I have to get out of here. Mm -hmm. And then, Chin Chin, one thing that you and I discussed was the role that technology has played in this, mm -hmm. information. Maybe your mic's not working so well. So the role that technology is playing in, in the kind of the, the spread of information. Sure. Like when we were filming, um, it was really interesting because a lot of refugees access information on their phones. So they communicate with their friends, their family, but also with smugglers or Volunteers were trying to help them get asylum, and that's how they get a lot of information. So that's great on the one hand, but on the other hand, there's a lot of fake news out there, like we all know, and there's a lot of information that is not so helpful to them that they do receive, and sometimes it doesn't, it doesn't end so well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so if we understand some of the causes, w what are the solutions we should be looking at as a, as a global community? Um, there are all of these huge humanitarian organizations that are f the Red Cross, you know, Save the Children. All of these organizations are basically created uh, and have been you know, created for that purpose specifically. What, what should they be doing? Well, the problem with the... Is that working? All right. The problem with that system is it, it's antiquated. It's archaic. Um, it doesn't work. It was founded around World War II, um, and they operate like it's maybe the 50s or the 60s. Um, you know, there's a big headquarters and there's bureaucracy. Um, and these humanitarian issues, bureaucracy can't be involved. There can't be, you know, the typical office stuff with turf and all that that exists. And it can't be because these are people's lives that are on the line. So uh, what we have been doing is attacking the system. And I'm, when I mean the system, it means everybody. So it's the United Nations. It's all those big organizations. It's the EU. It's the United States. It's all the governments of these countries funding these projects that they know don't work. Um, and leading to more disaster. So I'll come back to Lesbos as a microcosm to give a sort of eye on to the problems of the system at large. In the Greek island of Lesbos, it's now year three. Um, originally in the summer of 2015, 5,000 to 6,000 people were arriving on a daily basis and received absolutely nothing. It's year three. Tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of euros have gone into Lesbos alone. Over a billion has gone into Greece alone. There is no sign of any of it. So it's gone from the European Community um, Humanitarian Organization 
to either the Greek government or to these NGOs or to the United Nations. There's no sign of any of it. So wh where does it go? Corruption, incompetence, uh, bad projects, uh, it's a mess. So right now, if you were to visit Lesbos, you will find 8,000 people living in tents that are built for the summer. It's freezing and it's raining. This is year three and millions of euros have gone into it. So you ask yourself, so you know two things. You know, money's been spent, people are suffering. So that's when I come back to this thing and say, you know, the system is broken and we have to do better. And that's what led us to open our own place. And now we uh, are planning on continuing to open our own place. But essentially, our appeal is to leaders, high net worth individuals, high achievers to get involved in this issue because it affects us all. Um, because as I mentioned, the far right has sort of controlled this narrative, right? And you can't blame people for voting for them to some extent because the ruling class, our political elite, whether they're center left, center or center right, have failed the issue. They've completely failed the issue. So, you know, they seem like nice people and they maybe are okay, but they've, they've been a disaster on this issue. So now in Hungary and Poland and Czech Republic and obviously in Germany there's a problem and in Brexit, a lot of it is off the mischaracterization of the migration and refugee issue not being handled, right? And so we have to be sort of warriors for justice in the same way that our opponents are warriors for their cause, but we don't actually push back. Uh, and that's a problem, and I think we, we really need to focus and redouble our efforts. Because there's a lot of bad people out there and they're getting away with murder, literally. So Al Qaeda home. Can you tell us a little bit more about exactly what it is and what it does and how it's different from these bigger, traditional, maybe slightly archaic organizations? Well, I, the problem with NGOs is they're essentially not non-governmental, right? It means non-governmental organization, but most of their money is coming from governments. Governments have agendas, so very often they're carrying out the government's agenda. Now, the government's agenda right now in Europe is they don't want any more refugees. So the reason Lesbos is full of people in misery is to prevent anyone else from coming. Now that's crazy. They literally on purpose filled this island with people in horrible tents so other potential refugees know, don't come here. We don't want you in Europe. So Europe has decided we're a fortress. We're gonna keep sending weapons and causing these wars, but we're gonna cause a fortress. We're gonna have a fortress here. So Alpita, basically I walked into the Greek Minister of Migration's office and said, you know, uh, this is, a, Horrible, and he said, yeah, I know it's horrible. I said, give me a chance and we'll open our own place. So essentially it's a refugee shelter. Uh, it's a home where kids are educated, um, people are safe, uh, you know, they sort of have control over their own lives, they cook for themselves, and basically it'll just, it's very simple, it's just allowing people to be, live a dignified life. And so what, once someone arrives at Elpida, like what happens to them? Uh, they're intaked and, you know, sort of we find out who they are, they find out, we find out what they need, what happened to them, uh, you know, so if they need, like, very often everybody has, you know, trauma, so they very often need psychosocial or other counseling. Um, we show them to their room and uh, we, we say, you're safe here, you will be okay here, and so we've had... But for how long? Like, so how long... Until can we can resettle them so we do the entire process there is this asylum process and it's a mess you know things fall through the cracks but we follow through and make sure things don't follow through the fall through the cracks so we get them reunified or resettled into europe so it's uh, very often uh, not so long so as as we look ahead and i guess this is for both of you i mean what do you see happening going forward with this huge crisis is there any end in sight? Is there, you know, is, can we turn a corner? What do you think? Well, since we finished the film, unfortunately, I think things have gotten worse in most of the places we filmed in. If you look at the Rohingya crisis now, or the situation in the Middle East, or also in Africa, it hasn't really gotten better. And for example, I mean, it's such a complex issue to fix because the trailer that we just saw is two minutes long. The film is two hours, 20 minutes, and people come up looking really sad and depressed, you know, but it's two hours and 20 minutes. And I think the average time that a refugee spends being a refugee today is something like 26 years, which is a lifetime for most of us. So it's like Ahmed said, I mean, I think you identified many of the key problems really well, but it's going to take like tremendous effort to fix them. Okay, so we're almost out of time. If, if you had one, you know, you have a group of hugely influential, well-connected 
people in this room. If you had one piece of advice or guidance for how an individual with influence or reach or money or whatever it might be, what would that advice be? Well, I'd love to speak to all of you individually and we can, uh, we can do that. <laughs> I mean, everybody can do what I did, essentially. Um, it's not that complex. I'd love to, you know, I, I, I could speak to everyone because I literally, this, it, it will take all of us and then everyone we know uh, to act and act forcefully and relentlessly. Uh, Bob Marley said uh, the bad guys never take a day off and they really don't take a day off and we have to be sort of the opposite of the bad guys. We just can't take a day off on these issues. Okay. Well, we've run out of time, but just thank you so much. Congratulations on your work, first of all, because it's so remarkable to take the, make the decisions and dedicate that kind of energy to, to, to these kinds of projects. And thank you for coming and sharing your stories at Voices. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.